Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome uh, to the Friday night study. We're still reading A.T. Jones, um, number 25 of the 1895 General Conference Bulletin sermons that Jones did. And um, dealing with the three angels' messages, or the third angel's message more specifically. And um, we read half of this article uh, last Friday, and we're going to read the next half this evening. So it's, it's a pretty long sermon. Anyway, before we begin, can you join me with a word of prayer? A dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath, for the rest that we can have in Christ each day, and for the special time that we can have each Friday evening as we uh, study your word. We just ask, Lord, that um, the message given by Jones, that it will reach our hearts, that it will be from you, and that we will see things more clearly about our spiritual condition and our need of you. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, so good evening, happy Sabbath again. Now, um, in throughout these presentations, Jones, of course, is presenting the three angels' messages focused upon the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. And um, here he has been in this presentation addressing uh, how uh, forgiveness, atonement, repentance, uh, how we are, how the heart is changed, and how little part man has to play. That is, um, that we're dependent upon Christ for salvation. So he's here going to talk about repentance, and we, we read this already, this uh, paragraph, I think, last week. He says, many err in thinking that repentance is of such value as to atone for sin, but this cannot be. Repentance can in no sense be accepted as atonement. And furthermore, even repentance cannot possibly be exercised without the influence of the Spirit of God. Grace must be imparted. The atoning sacrifice must, must avail for man before he can repent. The Apostle Peter declaring, declared concerning Christ, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 5.31. Repentance comes from Christ just as truly as it does pardon. The sinner cannot take the first step in repentance without the help of Christ. Those whom God pardons, he first makes penitent. Nothing, nothing, nothing but faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Nothing but that saves the soul and nothing but that keeps the soul saved the great trouble with the jews uh, from the beginning unto uh unto the end was in having the lord so far away that even the things which god had given to signify his perfect nearness were taken and used as the tokens of his being far away Sacrifices, offerings, the tabernacle, the temple, its services, all those things were used by the Jewish teachers and the great mass of the people in such a way that all that these services meant to them was that they pointed to Christ away off yonder somewhere. It was understood that these things meant the Messiah, but it was the Messiah afar off, and they must make themselves good so as to bring him near. And these things were looked Two, as having virtue in themselves, and so as able to give righteousness. I'm not certain whether Seventh-day Adventists have got beyond the idea of those things back there, that they signified Christ afar off. I'm not saying now that Seventh-day Adventists think that Christ is now a way off, but I am afraid that they have not gotten away from the idea when they look at the sanctuary, its services, the sacrifices and offerings that that was intended to teach them that Christ teach them of Christ away off yonder somewhere. So it is said that these things all pointed to Christ, 
These things did not all point to Christ. These things did all point to Christ, that is the truth, but it was Christ near and not far off. God intended that all these things should point to Christ living in their hearts, not 1,800 years away, not as far off as heaven is from the earth, but pointing to Christ in their living experience from day to day. When we get fast hold of that idea, and then study the sanctuary, the sacrifices, the offerings, in short, the gospel as it is in Leviticus, then we shall see that that meant Christ, a living, present Savior to them day by day. And we shall also see that he is that to us today also. Now, this kind of reminds me of there was this song back in the past, um, sort of on the radio, but... um, It was the song, God is watching us from a distance. I don't know who sang the song or anything. Must have been in the 80s, maybe the 70s. Um, But the idea that God's watching us from a distance, we've seen in what Jones has presented is that Christ is closer than a brother. Um, And in fact, you know, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And the one thing I think that uh, Adventism presents that many Christians have a hard time uh, understanding is uh, the nearness of Christ to us. Now, it's sort of a, a little bit difficult idea, but there used to be this idea that Christ was this holy thing far off. And then we had in the modern times, especially in the present time, all kinds of uh, things that makes Christ maybe more human, uh, you know, not not really a sinless human, uh, but a sinful human. But he has the same, you know, so in order to get Christ to identify with us, they don't just have him take upon himself a human nature, but he, in a sense, takes upon himself our sin, that is, he is a sinner. I don't know if people have noticed this in the uh, depictions of Christ in the popular Christian films and so forth, but they don't have, you know, we used to have Christ that was just like holy, just separate from us in every single way. And now making, they're making him more like us as sinners. The thing is Christ is fully God. He's holy, but he's also fully human. And to become fully human doesn't mean he has to become a sinner. Quite the contrary. Um, You know, Christ is still God manifest in the flesh. He's not man manifest in the flesh. If he was, he couldn't be our savior. Um, But in trying to bring him, I I don't say the word balance is maybe not a good word. But just to correctly understand that Christ is not just coming to earth to to connect with us. He's actually lifting us up out of the pit of sin and bringing us into heavenly places and making us sit together with him in heavenly places. And and that idea isn't often drawn. So people want now a savior that's going to identify with them that they can relate to, but he's not really Christ. He's just a nice guy right so so we have these ditches that people go into um, in how they understand christ so we still reverence christ you know um even though he's close to us and actually if we understand it correctly we reverence him even more we understand his character even more but you know, this is the idea that the Jews had, that Christ was far off, God was far off, and you had to do something to fix yourself uh, to get God to accept you. And, of course, that idea still exists to some degree. Um, now, Jones doesn't use the word legalism. He he uses, uh, I can't remember the word he uses, um, ceremonialism. Um, but, you know, the idea of legalism, um, even those who believe that God doesn't expect us to be perfect are still legalists. 
because what they do is they say, well, there's no way that we can reach that standard of perfection. So we're going to lower the standard, but we still have to meet some standard, however low that is, in order to for God to somehow accept us. Now, there's different ways in which people frame it or explain it. Um, but people still operate to a large degree in a type of legalism or ceremonialism where there's something they they can do that they have to do on their own in order to meet the conditions so that God, God has to save them. And, you know, so it, it's a fine line sometimes. The la English language um, has difficulties with it. You know, one of the things that I'll run into when I'm discussing with non-Adventists who are attacking Adventism is they'll say, well, you believe that you're judged by your works, right? They believe that we're legalists, we're judged by our works because we keep Saturday as the Sabbath. And it's really clear that the only people who are judged by their works are the wicked. The wicked are judged by their works. The righteous are not judged by their works. They're saved by grace through faith. Because if we were judged by our works, we have our past sins. Even if I could live a perfect life from today on, I can't do anything about the past. So my salvation is dependent upon me having a perfect character. And that definitely I don't have except in Christ. But some people go a step further and say, well, if Christ can forgive me for my past sins, I can continue sinning. And then, you know, I can still be in heaven as long as, as I accept Christ. But if we're not saved, because remember, we have Paul who says we are justified by uh, by faith apart from the works of the law. And James says that we can't be justified by faith apart from the works of the law, because the works are going to testify of the faith. And we know that they're not contradicting each other. But you can see the problem with language. Sometimes we can use the same words to mean different things, and people can take the words of Scripture and say it means this to them, and the other person take the same words it means something else. So there's a difficulty there that we have. And even when we try to express the truth, it may not be understood. <clears throat> But let's read what Jones has to say, because I think he's very clear. There is gospel. There is Christian experience for us today in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, in Genesis, in Exodus, and in the whole Bible. But when we read those passages and say that those sacrifice and off sacrifices and offerings all pointed to Christ afar off from the Jews and expect that the Jews were to look through these services way off yonder to Christ to come sometime. When we read those scriptures and look at them that way, then we are reading those scriptures precisely as the Jews did. And we are standing precisely where they did at that time in those scriptures. And that will never do. No, we are not to look at the sanctuary with its furniture and paraphernalia standing as God placed it, with God's presence therein, and think that signified to them that they were to learn by it that God dwelt only in the sanctuary in heaven. When we look at it that way, then we are ready to think that that is about as near as he is to us, because that is as near as we have had him come to them. For if we look at it for them in that way, then if we had been there in their places, how would we have looked at it for ourselves in the same way? And this shows that had we been there, we would have been precisely as they were. The tendency is, even with us, to read of the sanctuary and its services and God dwelling in the sanctuary and the text, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them and say, yes, God dwelt among them in the sanctuary and that pointed to the sanctuary that is in heaven. And the time is coming when God will dwell with his people again, for he says, of the new earth, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God will dwell with them and be their God, and they shall be his people. So when the new earth comes, 
God is going to dwell with his people again. But where is God now? That is what we want to know. What matters it to me that he is going to dwell with his people on the new earth? What matters all this if he does not dwell with me now? For if he cannot dwell with me now, it is certain that he can never dwell with me on the new earth nor anywhere else, for he has no chance. What I want to know and what every soul needs to know is, does he dwell with me now? And if we put him back, away back yonder in the days of the Jews, and then put him away off on the new earth, what does that do for us now? How does that give him to men now? In that way, how is he with us now? That is what we need constantly to study. Now, you can see that there is a great deal more to that system of ceremonialism, or as I would say more accurately, legalism, than simply a little passing thing that disturbed the Jews a little while and then vanished. For human nature is still and ever bothered with it, as certainly as the devil lives, as certainly as the enemy is in the human heart. That mind, which is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, just as certainly as that is in the world, and as long as it is in the world, just so long the world will be cursed with ceremonialism, with legalism. And as long as there is any of that in my heart, I shall be in danger of being cursed with ceremonialism. What are we to do? What we are to do is to find such deliverance in Jesus Christ, such absolute victory and exaltation at the right hand of God in heaven, in him that that enmity should be completely annihilated in us, in him. Then we shall be free from ceremonialism. Then we shall be free from traditions and men's commandments and men making themselves a conscience for us. Men say, you must do this or you cannot be saved. You've got to do that or you cannot be saved. No, no. Believe in Jesus Christ or you cannot be saved. <clears throat> um, it is the same battle that was fought out in Paul's day and work. He was preaching Jesus Christ alone for salvation, but certain Pharisees who believed followed him around saying, oh yes, it's all well enough to believe in Jesus Christ, but there's something else. You've got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses or you cannot be saved. That contest lasted for years, and against it all, Paul fought all the way. He would not compromise a hair's breadth at any point. If ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Whatsoever of you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Nothing, nothing but Christ and faith in him. Well, they took it to the council at last, and there the Spirit of God decided that Christ and not ceremonialism is the way of salvation. That is the whole story. One was an attempt to fashion ceremonialism or legalism upon Christianity, or rather in the place of Christianity. The other was the living principle of Jesus Christ by living faith, actuating the life and the heart of those who believe in him. There is a vast difference between ceremonialism and principle. Jesus Christ wants us to find him so fully and so personally that the living principles of the truth of God as they are in Jesus Christ shall be our guide and that those living principles shining in the life of the man by the glory of Jesus Christ shall be our guide at every point. And we shall know what to do at that time. Then we do not need any resolutions or vows to force ourselves to do this, that or the other. That is the difference between ceremonialism and the principle of the living presence of Christ. Uh, Christ in the heart. One is all formalism and outward service without Christ, and the other is all Christ and Christ all and in all. Now, um, in the chat there, we, it says, we read that our bodies are temples uh, where the Holy Spirit dwells. So can the Holy Spirit really dwell in a continually sinning person. So the question there. Um, well, we know in what we've studied uh, so far 
And God wants to give us a new heart. He wants to live in us. He wants to write his law in our hearts. Now, we, we live in a sinful human nature, and we are sinners. Christ was never a sinner. He felt the guilt and the condemnation of the curse of sin his whole lifetime, just as any sinner feels it. And even the 144,000, after their sins have been blotted, blotted out, they cannot bring them to remembrance, still feel uh, as sinners, right? They don't suddenly feel like they're righteous, right? They feel the, uh, the guilt, the curse, the weight of sin, just as Christ felt it in human nature. It's part of our nature. Now, the Holy Spirit obviously wants to live in us and we see ourselves as sinners but this is a work that christ is to do we are to cooperate with him in that work but it is still christ's work christ can't do it without our co cooperation he's not going to change us against our will he's not going to live in us he knocks at the door of the heart and we can open that door and we can let him in but that work of cleansing the heart is Christ's work. Our work is to open the door of the heart to Christ to do that. If we close that door of the heart, Christ can't do that work. Now, of course, I'm using an illustration that's from the message uh, to the Laodiceans. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Right. So we know that God is knocking on the door of the heart, right? Um, um, so when it comes to looking at ourselves, we should always see ourselves as sinners. We never look at ourselves and see ourselves as righteous. But we know we sin, right? And sin comes to us, the knowledge of sin, through our connection with Christ. Without our connection with Christ, we don't even know that we sin. We think we're all right. We think we are okay. And we might get up in our minds that maybe maybe there's something in our, our life that's not right. You know, I have some sin, this or that sin that I, I keep falling into. And we think that that is the problem. If I can overcome that sin, that particular sin, uh, then I can look at myself as a Christian. And, and so we battle with these sins, and we never seem to overcome them. But then we're looking at the wrong place. Does it mean that you don't seek not to sin? I'm not saying, you know, you just lay back and let God do it all. But I'm saying that um, we need to recognize that the problem is not particular sins. But the fact that we are separated from God, that we are sinners, and getting changing this or that in our character, in our actions, doesn't uh, doesn't change our character. We're still sinners, right? It doesn't change that fact, and and we may not even see the sin that lies deep within our hearts. And this is what Jones is trying to get to with this message of righteousness by faith that had really evaded many Seventh-day Adventists at that time. They understood the obligations of the law, but they weren't looking to Christ for that. They could, they tried to conform their lives to what they saw was their responsibility, which there's nothing wrong doing that. But in doing that, they were looking to see the fruits of this in their lives, to see themselves no longer as sinners, and, and so that's not what we look to. So to trust in Christ, we have to trust that he can do what he says in spite of what we see in ourselves. That's an act of faith. Christ had to live righteousness by faith. He didn't see himself as righteous. But he knew by faith that he was the son of God because God told him that he was. And he knew then if he's the son of God, that no matter how he sees himself, he must be what God says. That is, God said, I'm well pleased, right? So Christ accepted by faith, in spite of what he felt, 
And he trusted in that righteousness, not in his own righteousness, but in the righteousness which came from his father. He could have been righteous on his own, but he couldn't have saved us if he had used his own righteousness because he wouldn't be our example. He needed to have righteousness, which is by faith. Okay, hopefully that helps with the question. But yes, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in us if we are uh, willfully uh, transgressing God's law. Okay, let us look again at the things the Jews were doing back there at the temple services, the sacrifices and the offerings, that you may see this a little more fully yet. And I know, and so do you, that the sanctuary, the temple, was a representation of the sanctuary, which is in heaven, that the sacrifices were representations of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and the priesthood and its services were represented representations of the priesthood of Christ. In all these things, God would teach them, and us too, of himself, as he is revealed in Christ. There was a sanctuary first, and there was a temple built in place of the sanctuary. And there was the temple standing on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And from that, God taught them that yonder is the true temple on Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem. God dwelt in this temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, in Palestine. And by that, he showed them that he dwelt yonder in the heavenly temple in Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem. And he said also, and this was true in both places, and from both sides, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. Anywhere else? With him also that is of a contrite and a humble spirit. When? We are reading away back yonder. When did he dwell with him that also that is of a contrite and humble spirit? as well as in the high and the holy place? Did he do this 700 years before Christ when Isaiah spoke? Yes. But did the Lord begin only then to dwell with him? It is of a humble and a contrite spirit, as well as in the high and holy place on Mount Zion. No. A thousand years before Christ, when David spoke, did he do it then? Yes. But had he only begun it then? No. He always, eternally, dwells in both places, with the humble and the contrite, as well as on high. Well then, did not God in that temple on the earth teach them not only how he dwelt in that heavenly country, but how he dwelt in the temple of the heart also? Most most assuredly, there was the earthly man Zion right before their eyes, representative of the heavenly Zion, which God would have right before their eyes of faith. It was Upon there upon Mount Zion, the high and lofty place in the earthly Jerusalem, is the temple and God dwelling in the temple. And this God would show that he dwelt not only there, but also in the temple of the heart, the sanctuary of the soul, of him that is of a contrite and humble spirit. And in putting his temple among sinful men and dwelling there in himself, he was showing us also how he would himself dwell in the temple of Christ's body among sinful men and in sinful flesh. Now, we have a harder time understanding this probably than the ancient Jews in the sense that they they understood that a temple, the temple, connected directly to heaven. That is the way that they understood it. Uh, Just like Jacob's ladder, where you see Jacob, uh, he, he... dreams and he sees these angels as ascending and descending upon this ladder, right? And of course, Jesus says uh, to Nicodemus, you shall see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, right? Christ is that connection between heaven and earth. And that temples symbolize this. People didn't actually think that, that, that God just dwelt up in heaven or that he just dwelt in the temple. They believe that 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 the, those two things were connected. Um, so this was just an idea that they they understood. So so the idea that we also are temples that God can dwell in us is really a very Jewish idea. That is, it's something that God has shown through the scriptures. 
That was not well known, though, uh, to all the ancient peoples. It's something that's part of God's word. Anyway, there, there too was a priesthood of the earthly temple on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. There was a priesthood of the sanctuary at Shiloh in the wilderness. That is true. Represented that, that it is true, represented the priesthood of Christ. But did that represent any priesthood of Christ before AD 1? Shall we say that that represented a priesthood of Christ that was far off? No. That priesthood in Jerusalem, in the sanctuary, in the wilderness, represented a priesthood that was already in existence after the order of Melchizedek. Thou shalt be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. No, no, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Was not Melchizedek a priest in the days of Abraham? And it is not the priesthood of Christ forever after the order of Melchizedek? Do you not see then that this whole system of services given to Israel is to teach them the presence of Christ then and there for the present salvation of their souls? Not for the salvation of their souls 1,800 years or 2,000 years or 4,000 years away. Surely, surely, it is so. Oh, it has always been Satan's deception and has always been the working of his power to get men, all men, to think that Christ is as far away as possible to put him. The farther away men put Christ, even those who profess to believe in him, the better the devil is satisfied. And when he will stir up the enmity that is in the natural heart, and set it to work in building up ceremonialism and putting this in the place of Christ. There was also circumcision. Was that a sign of something that was coming away off yonder? No, it was a sign of the righteousness of God, which they obtained by faith and which was there present in them who believed and when they believed. It was that to Abraham and God intended it to be that to every man. But instead of this, they had taken it and made it a sign of righteousness by circumcision itself, by works itself. Thus they left Christ all out and put circumcision in his place. It was a sign of the righteousness of faith. Um, sign of the righteousness of faith. They did not have faith and therefore they undertook it. Uh, to make it a sign of righteousness by some other means. And thus it became only a sign of selfishness. God gave them his law, the Ten Commandments. Was it that they might obtain righteousness by that? No, but that it might witness to the righteousness which they obtained by faith in Jesus Christ abiding in the heart. That is what the Ten Commandments were for, just as they are today. So were not the sacrifice offered typical of Christ? Yes but it was typical of Christ present by faith. Was not Christ right there? Was not Christ the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Was not Christ a gift of God there before the world was? And when he called on men from Adam unto all, as long as the sacrifices were offered in that way, when he taught them to offer those sacrifices, what was that but teaching them that that was a token of their appreciation for the great sacrifice that God had already made for them and of which they were enjoying the benefit of having that gift in the heart, which was Jesus Christ. Well, we need not go any further, farther. There is enough to illustrate. It. Is it not plain then that everything that God gave to them in that day was intended to teach them concerning the personal living Savior, personally present with them, and if they had only received him, and all they needed to do to receive him was to believe in him. The gospel was preached unto them, Hebrews 4, 2. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. How did they come short of it? How? By not seeing Christ crucified present with themselves in the thing which they were doing. Now, when we read over those things and study them, the sanctuary, for instance, and see only so many boards and so many sockets and so many curtains and all these in type of something up yonder in heaven and that all there and that all there is to it and not see or know 
Christ in that, in our own personal experience, wherein are we different from them? I do not say that it is the way that it is done. I do not say that is the way that it is done. But I say that if a person looks at it now in that way, then where is the difference between him and the Jews of old? There is none. Is Christ a way off still? No. He is not far from every one of us. And what is not far? It does not say he is not very far. No, it says he is not far. And it certainly as you get a definition of not far, you have the word near. He is near to every everybody, to us, and he always has been. He was also near to them, and he always was near. But by unbelief, they could not see him near. And now in all those services which they gave him, which he gave them, as well as those which he has given us, he wants us all to see the nearness of the living Christ dwelling in the heart and shining in the daily life. That is what he wants us all to see. And he wants us all to see it all. That is the way he wants us to look at it. Now, another thing, uh, well, before I even read that paragraph. So we know we, we can look at biblical chronology and we can find all these dates. We can look at the sanctuary and we can measure things. And, and those things, because they're in the Bible, they obviously are important. Uh, they're, they're symbols. They give us an understanding when we study God's word. But just knowing those things themselves isn't going to bring salvation. We have to know Christ. We have to have him in our daily experience. And through these types and symbols, we come, Christ is revealed. We come to know him. We can know that he is real, that he came and he died for us. We can find that he's pers personally working in our lives. That we're not just imagining things. We don't just have um, you know, some kind of self-fulfilled delusion as Christians. We have object objective things that we can measure. We have prophecy. And so we can look at these things and we can know, in spite of what we see in ourselves, that God has revealed himself to us to come and to save us. And the understanding of the sanctuary message is to show us this. That God came in history, not just in the time of Christ, but in Millerite history. And also in our day, Christ is there revealing himself that we are walking with him. And that's why it's, it's um, so amazing to me that people in this movement can say, well, we weren't following God. God wasn't leading this movement, you know, for however long you want to say it going to be if you want to go back to 2012 or wherever god wasn't leading us in the july 18 2020 prediction well if god wasn't leading you then you don't know god at all and and you can't now say well he wasn't leading us we were just deceived and now he's leading us today right we know that god is with us personally that in christ we can know his working in our lives day by day. And so that's why he has given us this message. That's why he's given us all of these things to study and to understand in his word. If we can't by those things know that God is working in our lives today, then there would be no benefit in those things. They would just be hell, hell, uh, head knowledge. It would just be something to exalt self. But we know uh, that these things were meant to obey self and to lift up Christ. So let's go on. Now, another thing. What was it that caused all that? What was it that caused them to put Christ afar off and change the sacred living services of God into ceremonialism or legalism? It was the enmity. It was self the enmity of self that caused it all. And that self expressed itself in unbelief because it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That put a veil over their faces so that they could not see the end of that which was before their eyes. They could not look to the end of that which is abolished. 
Not that this end was so far off that they could not see from where they were clear down to the end of it. That is not the thought at all, but that they could not see the the object of it. They could not see what was the intent of it with themselves at that time. But we are too ready to give to that expression the thought that here was something which pointed to something else away down yonder, and they could not see from there clear down to the end of it. But that is isn't all wrong. No, those things which were before their eyes were intended to point to something right close to them. And that was Christ himself personally present with them, within their hearts at that time. That was the end of it, the purpose. That was the object, the aim, right? So um, that passage in 2 Corinthians, let's, let's go there. I know I, it's one of my favorite passages just because once I understood it, um, definitely helped me, you know, in my personal life to see some things that I, I hadn't seen before. And just a second here, so I'll bring that up. Um, so it's in Second Corinthians chapter 3. Um, now this, this whole section, um, I mean, to go through the whole chapter is is pretty important. But he's talking here about this epistle or letter. So he's going to use this idea of a letter or an epistle of commendation. Um, But he says, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. And and that we're going to be, uh, we're the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of a living God, not of in tables of stone, but in the fleshly, ta- fleshy tables of the heart. So he's going to talk about the law that's written in the heart. <clears throat> he says, who also hath made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So the ministration of death here, Paul is talking about the law written and engraven in stones. Now, is the law holy, the commandment holy, just and good? Yes. Why does he call it a ministration of death? Well, for the simple fact that the law written and engraven on stones can only stand as a testimony against the fact that we are sinners. It can't make us righteous. It can only dec- it can only show God's righteousness in contrast with our own. So he uses this illustration of Moses going up into the mountain and that this glory, because remember when Mos- Moses went up into the mountain, it's the second time he receives the Ten Commandments. And he put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now, he says here to the end, so to the purpose of it, right? So there's something that he put this veil over his face because they were unwilling to look at the light coming from God's word, right? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So the reason that they were in darkness is they were unwilling to accept the light that would show that they are sinners. And we can't be in that position. If the veil is taken away, we're going to see ourselves as sinners. So that's why he says at the end of this chapter, he says, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So the idea here is that if we want to be like Christ, we have to remove that veil. That is, we have to behold this light that is shining upon our sin and showing that we're sinners. So 
what people try to do is to make themselves believe that they aren't sinners by meeting some kind of standard of righteousness that they have set up or men have set up, that if, if I don't do certain things, then I can consider myself a Christian. But yet, all we have done is put a veil over God's law so that we can't actually see that we are sinners. We have met some standard of righteousness that man has set up, and we can then think of ourselves as righteous, as good, as God's chosen people. And yet we're, we're just wretched, um, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And we have no conception because we read the law with a veil over it. That is what man does. That is the enmity. That is the ceremonialism. Okay, so let's go back to Jones here. Therefore, through the enmity, this unbelief which produced form formality, which produced formality, blinded their eyes and put a veil over their faces so that they could not see the meaning, the object of that which was abolished. And of course not. As long as that enmity is in the heart of man, even today, it produces unbelief there and it puts a veil over his face so that he cannot see to the end of these things that were abolished. He cannot see that the object of these things was the living presence of Christ in the temple of the heart day by day as the service was going on. It all means Christ and he is not far. The object, the end of all these things is right near but they cannot see it. Why? Let us read now that passage in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, beginning with the first verse. So he's going to go through what I just did. Uh, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter. The letter of what? Of the New Testament. They have the letter of it, did they not? They have the letter of the new and the old both, but all they had was the letter. Was All they had was the letter and was in the letter. Who hath also made us able ministers, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter killeth. What letter killeth, kills? Letter, letter of what kills? Letter of the New Testament, as well as any other letter. Here's a book. There's some letters in it. Those are simply the forms which express ideas. Those letters are not the ideas. They are the forms that contain the ideas and convey, convey those ideas to us. Those things back there were the letter, the forms that contain the ideas, the spirit and the grace of God. That is true. But in it, all they saw, only, they saw only the letter. Did they get the idea, the grace, the spirit? No, they had only the form, the letter even as we read in Romans 2.20, which hath the form and knowledge of the truth. There's the law of God. Take, take it there as a man sees it in letters. That is the form, the perfect form too, of knowledge and truth. And take it as it is in Jesus Christ. And we have the thing itself, the complete idea of it, and all the grace and spirit of it. That you may see this, I will read one of the finest expressions I have seen upon the subject. The righteousness of the law was presented to the world in the character of Christ. In the letter of the law, we have the form of it. As man looks at it and sees it as it is in tables of stone or on a leaf, he sees the form of knowledge and truth. But in Christ, we have the perfect substance and idea itself. In the letter, we have the perfect pattern, perfect form of knowledge and truth. Yet it is only the form. 
In Christ, we get the very substance, an idea of knowledge and of truth expressed in the words, the letters, which are the form containing the truth. So then, while the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. Now, another way you could look at it, because the word spirit is actually the word breath. So if you have something written on a page, you have letters. But in order for it to have meaning, it has to be read or spoken. And in the past, they never actually read silently. They only read out loud. Um, so the idea is that the letter written there on stone, it can't save you. It has to be expressed. It has to be spoken, right? And Christ spoke everything into existence. He is the word. He's not the letter, right? In the beginning was the word. But the idea of a word is something that's spoken. The logos, right? He wasn't the letter. Right. It wasn't just something written. It was something living and real. And so when you speak, you use breath. That's your spirit. OK. <clears throat> um, but if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. For the glory of his countenance, countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. So we can see that to see something written is one thing, but to see it lived out, it's more glorious. And, and the character of Christ manifested in his people is a powerful witness of the care of, of God's work of salvation of the gospel. Why was it necessary that we should put a veil? Why was it necessary that he should put a veil over his face? Was it to keep them from seeing it? Was it to prevent their looking to the end of it? No, it was because their minds were blinded. Moses came down from the mount with his face radiant with the glory of God, but their sinfulness, which was the consequence of their unbelief, which was the consequence of the enmity, caused them to be afraid of the bright shining glory of God, and they ran away. When Moses discovered why they did not come near, he put a veil over his face. And this veil was upon his faith simply because of the veil that was upon their hearts through unbelief. Do you see? They could not see the object of that glory upon Moses' face. Why? Because their minds were blinded. But were their minds blinded only then and at that time? No, until this day remaineth, the same veil, uh, unto this day, remaineth the same veil untaken away. Where? When? In the reading of the Old Testament, the veil is still there. But oh, when the heart shall turn to the Lord, then the veil shall be taken away. Because in Christ is abolished the enmity that created the unbelief. Their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same Veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And as he says, it's the heart that turns to the Lord. Upon how many hearts is the veil then? Upon every natural heart. The mind is the natural heart. The mind of the natural heart is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where? Oh, oh, in him in whom we find the abolition of this enmity, in whom we find the breaking down of all this formalism, in whom we find the annihilation of all ceremonialism or legalism, in whom we find life, the light, the bright, shining glory. Of Jesus Christ. In him, there is liberty. Now, in the Old Testament, in the services which he had appointed, in the rites and forms which he gave there gave, we shall see Christ. And in the performance of all that is appointed, we shall see only the expression of the love of Christ that is in the heart already by faith. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image 
from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm so glad that Jesus Christ has abolished the formality. He's cleared away, broken down, and left in ruins that middle wall of partition that was between men and taken it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When we in him and with him are nailed to the cross, then we find the enmity abolished, the wall broken down, and we are all one in Jesus Christ. Christ is all in all and all this in order that God may be all in all. So there we finished um, this study. So I hope that was helpful. Um, and uh, anybody watching these videos who, who wants to have a copy of these, these uh, uh, you can just email me, Theodore James Turner at gmail.com, and I can send you a PDF of it. Um, but a very powerful message from Joan, something that I think uh, is missing in Adventism, missing in our lives. Because we are trying to see ourselves as righteous, to get ourselves righteous so that we think that we're worthy in some way. But everything comes from Christ. And so that's where we, what we look to. When we look to Christ, we'll see ourselves as sinners. And if we believe, then we can trust that Christ is fulfilling in us his will. In spite of what we see spite of what we feel. Others may see it, but we will not, because we're not looking for it. We're looking for righteousness in Christ, not in ourselves. And if we do see righteousness in ourselves, we can be assured that we are under a self-deception. Because if we're looking at Christ, we will only see unrighteousness in ourselves, not righteousness. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath and uh, the time that we have and we have had this evening to study. We pray that the Sabbath will be a blessing to each person. Help us to look to Christ by faith, to trust in the work that he wants to do in us in spite of what we see in ourselves. We pray that we can cooperate with him in this work, that we can allow him into our heart, that we can confess our sins, that we can see the conviction and power that comes from knowing Christ. Because if Christ dwells in us, we know that sin cannot dwell there. Help us to trust in you, we pray for one another, pray for this movement, for this message, and for your people upon this earth. And we pray it and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.